Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Tuesday, June 23rd, that puts us in Acts chapter number 23. I hope you follow along in your Bibles as we go through these studies. It'll help you to follow the text as I read it and uh, see it for your own eyes in the scripture. I have a friend who's a missionary in another country, and he says uh, he always asks his folks to turn to every scripture, even when there uh, are numerous scriptures, multiple scriptures to turn to. He asks them to see it in their own Bibles because they've been mis uh, mistaught, uh, lied to, and manipulated by other religions, denominations in the past. So he wants them to see what God has written word for word in their very own Bibles. So let's not take for granted the word of God. And we're going to cover chapter 23 today here in the book of Acts. After we finish today, there'll only be five chapters left. Hard to believe. We've really cruised through this book. I guess time is flying in the month of June. 35 verses this morning. Let's pray and we'll start. Father, help us today to learn and study this book. Help us to uh, remember the things we've read and studied the last couple of days as they pertain to today's lesson as well. Speak to our hearts, please, and help us nourish us with your word. We ask in Christ's name, amen. All right, so the last couple chapters, as I mentioned while praying, uh, is... Paul in trouble. He's in the midst of trials. He's been told not to go to Jerusalem by the Holy Spirit, by fellow believers, but he decided to go ahead and go anyway. So the Jews throw a fit about him. The Greeks arrest him and they go to try him. And it turns out that they want to turn them, turn him right back over to the Jews. Uh, he gives his testimony of how Christ came to him and the Jews do not like it. They seek to kill him and so he's arrested again. Uh, but then he's found to be a Roman citizen and so uh, the Romans take him and they look at his situation and they say, well, you know what? This has nothing to do with Roman law. Let's turn you over to your own people, the council. So he keeps going back and forth between the Jews and, and, and the secular uh, rulers of the day, and then they send him back, and, and it's just a back and forth. So here we are, chapter 23, verse number 1. Paul is addressing the Jewish council now. It goes by the name of Sanhedrin. So if you ever hear that name Sanhedrin, think of a Jewish Supreme Court. That may not be exactly correct, but uh, it gives you an idea of what is going on here. Chapter 23, verse number 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council. So notice here, he's paying attention to who he's talking to. Remember, Paul was a devout Jew. He, there's no doubt he knows a lot of these guys. He knows who they are. He knows their background. He may have been friends with them at one time. So he's looking at the crowd, trying to determine who it is he's speaking with. And he says, men and brethren. Interesting to use that term brethren, isn't it? Hey, I'm one of you. You remember me. I'm Paul. I'm the same guy. Uh, I just have, you know, met Jesus here. I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So he's reminding his peers of his track record. He's letting them know, hey, what have I ever done wrong? How have I ever disappointed you? You guys know me. You can trust me. Verse 2, and the high priest Ananias, so this is our third Ananias in this book, isn't it? Ananias number one was from chapter number five. He is the one who sold a piece of land, did not give all the proceeds to the Lord after he told God he would, and so God killed him. Ananias number two was the guy that the Lord told to take Paul, back then he was Saul, into his house and, and help him recover from his blindness and recover from the Damascus Road incident. This is Ananias number three, uh, third guy, different person. He's the high priest at this time. And look here, Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So all Paul did was stand up and start his defense, and immediately the high priest says, smite him. 
And so the soldiers smacked Paul across the mouth. Verse 3, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Oh my goodness, you don't talk to the judge that way, right? And he says, God's going to smite you. This is, came true. There is a historian, a biblical historian named Josephus. At the time of, of the first century AD, uh, Josephus recorded a lot of biblical history. And he tells us that this Ananias high priest was killed during a particular war. So, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. And that's a, a term uh, defining hypocrisy. You're one way on the outside, but on the inside, you're something different. For, thou, for sinnest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? It was not <clears throat> lawful while Paul is here on trial, and it's not even a legitimate trial at this point. Uh, he's just, you know, they're bringing him up to, to figure out what they want to do with him. And uh, he, he's smitten, which is contrary to what the law teaches. So he says, you're going to judge me after the law, but you don't even abide by it yourself. You're a hypocrite. Verse 4, and they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? He said, you're going to talk to the high priest that way? You're going to talk to the judge that way? You, you can't talk to him that way. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So this verse is a little bit confusing. When I come to confusing verses, I do look into them a little bit. Uh, historically, I read some commentaries about it. And this is one of those things where not everybody understands exactly what's going on, which is kind of funny. Because anytime I need a commentary and I go to them, they generally are stumped on the same places that I get stumped. And so let me read it again. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. So Paul's saying, yeah, well, I wish he wasn't the high priest. That's, that's all that's saying. But then it's, it goes on to say, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of, of thy people. So on one hand, the, the, what I have been able to dig up historically is that because of this Roman occupation, this is a was a very tumultuous time concerning the council and, and the high priest and the numbers of men that they went through that were high priests. And so some, some think Paul is alluding to maybe some funny business. Ananias really shouldn't have the position, but he's got it. Uh, others are just saying, you know, uh, I wish he weren't the high priest because uh, I have, you know, I can't but speak up against this guy. He's a terrible person, and I wish he wasn't the high priest so that I could get by with it. Uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, we do know this. Paul is being really mouthy right here. It's, it's as though you'd stand up to the judge in your courtroom and say, Judge, you're a hypocrite. You don't have a, a right to hold a position on that bench. So he's ruffling some feathers. Verse 6, But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So, this is really interesting. Paul looks out at the crowd and he sees Sadducees and Pharisees. Imagine them to be two different political parties. Imagine if he said, I perceive uh, that, that thou art Republicans and Democrats. And then he says, I myself am a Democrat, and I was raised uh, the son of a Democrat, right? So immediately, he's going to get the Democrats' favors, or flip it if you want. I am a Republican, the son of a Republican. He decides to take his stand with the Pharisees. And notice what he says at the end, Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now, let me read the next two verses so we can explain to you why that matters. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, 
but the Pharisees confess both. So this isn't really a political party division like I, I used to illustrate it. it. It's a religious party dis division, if you will. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the spirit world and angels and so forth. The Pharisees did. And so Paul is bringing this out to intentionally create the division and to get the Pharisees on his side. And we're going to see in a minute that it works. Uh, but notice what he says, the last part of verse 6, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. You know, he's, he's sort of making up the charges against himself. He's saying, you know, us Pharisees, we believe in the resurrection. And that's what they're trying to call me on. So now the Pharisees, they're not only going to defend Paul, but they're defending him because they're defending themselves and their own position uh, theologically. So, verse 9, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So immediately this works. Paul's tactics work. He stands up and says, hey, you know, I'm a Pharisee, and the reason they're doing this to me is because of my stand on the resurrection. So the Pharisee said, well, what are you doing arresting this guy? He's right. God's obviously with him, and God's spoken to him. Verse 10, and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So now we're going back to Roman, the chief captain here. He says, wait a minute, these guys are going to kill him, fighting over him. Go get him and bring him into the castle. Verse 11, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So Jesus now tells Paul, hey, you're going to survive this. You're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You've testified for me in Jerusalem, which, by the way, he wasn't supposed to be doing. But since he's there, God's going to use that, and he's going to use it for good. That's Romans 8, 28, isn't it? We know all things work together for good to them that love God. So uh, verse number 12. Now some uh, funny business <clears throat> goes on. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. So a group of men get together now and they say, hey, let's decide here together. Let's make a pact to kill Paul. None of us will eat or drink until we do it. So that's going to mean that they're going to execute this decision hastily because they want to get back to life, eating and drinking. They're going to say, okay, let's not eat and drink for 30 days and then go after him. But they decide, you know, we're not going to do anything until we take him out. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders, so this is the Jewish side of things, and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him and we or ever he come near are ready to kill him. So the 40 men that have made this pact to kill Paul, they go meet with the, the Sanhedrin and they say, we want you to go to the chief captain, the Roman, and say that we need to, to question Paul a little bit further. And when they bring him down, we'll ambush him and kill him and take him out. Verse 16, and when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So these guys didn't know it, but Paul's nephew overhears this plot. Obviously, he's part of, of the, the group here. Uh, we believe he's a young man, and we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, and by that, I mean a, a more of a child, maybe early teenager. <clears throat> uh, verse number 17, Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So his nephew comes and tells him, hey, they're looking to kill you, Paul. And so he says, well, nephew, you need to go and tell the chief captain this information so that it doesn't happen. Verse 18, so he took him 
and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called unto me, uh, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. And here's why we think he's a young boy uh, or a preteen. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is this thou hast to tell me? You're not going to find one grown man taking another grown man by the hand and pulling him aside. It's a little boy or a, a teenager, early teen. Come with me over here, young man, kind of thing. So now Paul's nephew is going to tell the chief captain what's going on. Verse 20. And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as they uh, would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man what thou hast showed, that thou hast showed these things to me. So the nephew fills him in on the plot to ambush and kill Paul, and he tells the chief captain. The chief captain says, good, thank you for the information. Don't let anybody know that you told me this. Don't talk about it. Just go your way and be quiet. Verse number 23. And he called unto him two centurions. So this is the chief captain calling a couple soldiers, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten. So a score is twenty, so three score is sixty, plus ten is seventy. So two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. So you've got 400 men and 70 men on horseback. That's 470 guys to guard Paul from 40 plus men. So 10 times. So he's got 10 men for every one Jew that's going to try to assassinate Paul. Provide them beasts, verse 24, that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. So the chief captain is getting him out of out of Jerusalem so that he can stand before Felix, the Roman governor, and be tried. Verse 25, and he wrote a letter after this manner. So here's the chief captain writing to Felix. This is the, the body of the letter. Claudius Lysias. Now, this name, Claudius, is a Roman name. And it's the Roman name that he took upon himself when he paid to become a Roman citizen. If you remember, we talked a day or two ago about that, how you could buy your Roman citizenship. And so when, he, when this man did this, he bought the name Claudius. Lysias is his Greek last name or surname. And so here, Claudius is Roman name. Lysias is Greek name. Claudius Lysias is how he is known, and it also reveals to people who he is. He's born Greek, but now he's a Roman citizen. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. This man was taken, speaking of Paul, of the Jews, and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. So he's telling the governor Felix, hey, Paul is a Roman citizen, and the Jews were trying to kill him, but I rescued him. <clears throat> Verse number 28. And when I would have known the cause whereof, wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. So I wanted to know why they were after him. So I stood him before them, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. So he says, as I heard the trial play out between the Jewish council and Paul, I noticed there was no accusation as far as Romans are concerned. What he's done, he's violated their Jewish law. And even at that, I don't see any reason to put this man to death. I think this Roman citizen is being treated unjustly and unfairly. Verse 30. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. 
And so this part hadn't actually happened yet. This verse, he said, so I, I sent him away, and then I met with the Jews, and I asked them, you know, hey, what reason do you have to uh, slay this guy? What did he do uh, against you? And they didn't have any answer for me. So he's going to do this, but he's sending this letter. Of course, it's not email. It's not a text. It's not instant communication. So by the time Felix read this letter, Claudius Listius would have already had done this. Verse 31, Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night unto Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. So they safely deliver him uh, there. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, epistles a letter, presented Paul also before him. So the soldiers get him there. They get him to Felix. They give Felix the letter. They stand Paul up in front of Felix. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, which is a Roman province, what's, what province are you from, Paul? I'm from Cilicia. Okay, Roman province. Verse 35, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So he says, okay, I'll go ahead and hear this case. I'll listen to you. I'm also going to let your accusers come. And I want to hear from them what they are accusing you of. And that's where the chapter ends. So we've been here now three chapters at least, I think, where we... Uh, have seen this trial continue to go back and forth, and we know that this is not unusual. We saw Pilate and Herod uh, sending Jesus back and forth during his trials. The Romans don't want to judge matters of Jewish uh, law. It's not their realm. They stick to their own uh, government and they stick to their own secular society. If Paul was, you know, robbing and stealing and murdering, yeah, sure, the, the Romans would try him. But if it's a matter of blasphemy, as far as the Jews are concerned, what is he's not going to judge in those matters. So really interesting to see. It's also interesting, if you want to take something practical from this, it's good to, uh, to understand that nothing can happen to you that God doesn't allow to happen to you. Uh, Paul should not have gone to Jerusalem. If he'd not gone, none of this probably would have happened. But he went back there. He was bound and arrested, and uh, all this is going on. But God's going to take care of his man, and he's going to make sure that uh, he's going to use him to his full extent as he desires to do so. And so, nor you or I, we, we're not going anywhere until God is done with us. We don't need to be fearful of what man can do unto us. We need to stand for right, stand for truth, uh, love God, love people as he commands us, but do right. And uh, however that turns out, so be it. Amen? All right, a little bit longer, a little bit normal time here on this chapter, 23 minutes we're almost at. Thanks for watching. Like, love, better yet, share the videos, and uh, hopefully they'll be a blessing to someone. We'll pick it up tomorrow, chapter number 24. Uh, let me know in the comments the next book you'd like to learn from. Uh, Romans, Christina Hendricks talked about Romans yesterday. Others of you have said Romans. Ephesus has been requested. I'm sorry, Ephesus, Ephesians. And uh, the book of Psalms, too, which would be quite the lengthy study, I think. Uh, so let me know what you'd like to hear next in the comments there, and, and we'll figure out a nice vote for the final three days and take it from there. God bless you. Have a great Tuesday.